uh, Pete Rambo. Pete Rambo. Uh, Pete Rambo. Pete Rambo. Rambo's article. He, Pete Rambo. He, you know, Pete Rambo. Rambo. How many people are willing to, okay, let me consider another perspective. Let me see what different respected examiners and theologians have said. I would, I would beg to say not very many. You have to go into a text willing to consider other points of view. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to hear other sides. You have to be willing to consider that perhaps certain terms uh, in the source text need to be viewed another way. And I don't pick up from a lot of the things that you have read that someone like Pete Rambo is that open-minded. Shalom. Uh, my name is Pete Rambo, and recently I was the subject of a video called Controversy Corner by J.K. McKee and uh, David Wilbur. It's actually, I guess, David Wilbur's work uh, with J.K. as the guest. And on this video, um, they had a number of things to say with regards to addressing me and some things that I have written. And it is fair, it is necessary for the record to be set straight and for me to take the time to uh, explain more and to bring to light and to demonstrate the uh, material that, uh, that I've been writing and why it is significant and important. In the, uh, in the video that uh, uh, David Wilbur and JK put together, it was a long video, about an hour and 15 or 20 minutes long, and there were significant errors. A number of errors uh, theological, a uh, number of errors with regards to logic and logical fallacies, a number of errors with regards to, I believe, what the King is doing and what, uh, what Scripture has to say. Uh, and so these will be addressed. It's going to take some time. And I plan on putting together multiple response videos, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But what I want to do is I want to, I want to begin by saying that certainly this is a significant conversation. While my detractors were dismissive in their response and were somewhat a mocking at points, uh, and, and we will take these clips and unfold them for you, what, uh, what I want to, to make sure that I articulate to you the, the viewer, the listener, is that this is an important conversation. This is not a new conversation. This is a conversation that goes back hundreds, hundreds of years in Christendom. And up to this point, uh, generally when the conversation happens, there have been multiple theologians along the way. There have been multiple published books. We are going to share some of this information with you as we go. But this is a conversation that's been going on for hundreds of years. But often what happens is, is the messenger gets shot instead of the message being dealt with. And the fact that, uh, that God's Word has some very clear things to say on some matters that, uh, that we will be addressing that are uncomfortable truths, that are uncomfortable things for, for Western civilization and Greco-Roman Christian background or Greco-Roman Christianity, the, uh, the traditions and influences that we've inherited, because some of those things are uncomfortable, usually the message gets swept away. And often those who carry the torch become vilified and, uh, and get pushed out of the arena. Well, that's not going to happen here because what's, what we have is we have a much broader range of reach. We have the ability to encourage each of you, the reader, uh, or the viewer to go and do your own research. You can do your own due diligence. You do not need to count on the ivory towers. You don't have to count on uh, people that uh, can list a, a number of degrees or anything of this sort and assume that they've got all the answers. Instead, I challenge you, and we're going to bring this information to you, I challenge you to do your own due diligence. Don't trust Pete Rambo. Don't trust me. What I want you to do is I want you to trust what the Word of God says. I want you to take the time to read and study. Look at what was said by Ochino in the 1500s. Look at what was said by Dr. Madan uh, in the 1700s. Look at what was said by James Campbell in the 1800s. Look at what was said by William Luck, a, a professor at Moody Theological Institute, uh, Moody Bible Institute, in late uh, 1900s and early 2000s. Look. 
let's lay out some information and I'm going to point you to a number of resources. I'm going to point you to things written and researched by laymen, by uh, seminary professors, by doctors of theology, by um, sociologists. I'm going to point you to information that supports everything that I've put together. But first of all, who's Pete Rambo? Who am I? Why, why should I be um, willing to take a stand in a very hard place? I am the son of missionaries. I grew up in South America on the mission field. Um, I was raised in an evangelical um, Christian background. It was a very conservative uh, Presbyterian denomination, but we had, uh, had solid evangelical roots. Uh, myself, I, I knew early that I was called to ministry. Uh, I did the perfect Jonah and uh, took uh, the um, uh, uh, trip to college that I had at Erskine College here in, uh, in Western South Carolina. I took the opportunity to join the ROTC department. I spent four years in the military. I, I was signed on for eight, but um, Father blessed me and was able to leave early. But uh, during those four years, I went to combat. Uh, I was uh, a combat veteran, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I met my bride um, at Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. Um, was in business for a while. Had a number of different business, uh, business things where I managed businesses and this sort of thing. But the father continued to restore this call that he had placed on me prior to going to college. And finally, in uh, 1998, I answered the call, attended um, CIU, Columbia International University, uh, went to their uh, Biblical School of Missions and Theology, or Seminary and Theology, I forget the, the long title. But the bottom line is I earned a master's degree uh, there, and then I pastored a church for 10 years. About the eighth year of my ministry during that time frame, uh, the Father started asking me some really hard questions that I couldn't answer with my church doctrines. And ultimately, it led me to a place where today I believe in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Uh, but I also believe that God never did away with the feasts of the Lord. He never did away with Shabbat, the Sabbaths. He never did away with uh, the food, the dietary instructions that He gave us. And so about, uh, about 10 years ago, I began keeping those parts of the Torah that uh, I believe God said are forever. And in that, I began to have a real love for my brothers of Judah, and I began to understand um, much about prophecy and what prophecy has to say with regards to the restoration of the kingdom. Uh, Yeshua, when, when the disciples were seeing him for the last time, he's standing on the Mount of Olives, Acts chapter 1, verses 6, 7, 8, right along in there. They've spent time with him post-resurrection, and so this is, they know, they're not going to see him again for a while, they have no idea what, and they ask him the most pressing question that they can ask. They say, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore Kingdom Israel? And he doesn't say, you bunch of adults, we're starting something new. What he says is, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but specifically Yeshua tells him, he says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, why does he name those four places? Jerusalem is the capital of where the Jews are and they are in Judea. And then the house of Israel, the former capital was in Samaria and they had been scattered to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what he does right there is he is very quickly, he says, go restore the kingdom. Go be my messenger and begin the process of restoring the kingdom. And one of the things that I began to understand as I began to understand my connection to the Torah, my connection to the house of Israel, that it's not just a, a, a spiritual connection, but there may be a very real physical connection. But the fact is the seed of Abraham was scattered to the ends of the earth. And the fact is Yeshua said in Matthew 15, 24, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's here to gather that back and ultimately bring the two houses, the two sticks together, as we see in Ezekiel 37. So I wrote a book. It was actually my second book titled Ten Parts in the King. I had some help with that, but it was a, a terrific book that spells out and details um, the restoration of the kingdom and the two parts, the two pieces, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and how the Father intends to bring those back together. 
And then I began wrestling with, okay, so if he's bringing the kingdom back together, what does that look like? How does it function? And I came to a realization over time. My realization is this. We, Israel, are a tribal, are a patriarchal tribal family. So often we think about, oh, nation Israel, and we think about it in terms of a nationality, or we think about it in terms of something very different than a family, very different in understanding the authority and the structure and how all of that works. Well, that led me to a place that I, be, I decided to go through the Torah. Every year when I go through the Torah, I have a particular lens. I'll choose a lens. I, I remember one year I went through and all the way through the Torah, as I'm going through the Torah cycle, I'm looking for everything I can find about Yeshua. I want to identify Yeshua in the Torah. Uh, there, there have been other years where I've gone through and, and I have a specific, you could call it an agenda. You could call it a focus, and maybe that's the best way to put it, is it's a focus as I'm looking for particular parts. Well, about two years ago, I focused as I went through, and I was writing a commentary. My focus was, what's the structure of the kingdom? How does it work? And I had already recognized that God doesn't begin with an organization and then bring people to an organization. And I recognize that that's been tried multiple times within the house of Israel. Hey, let's get all the, you know, let's get the house of Israel back together and I'm going to start an organization. And I, I realize that, that that's a, a valiant attempt from man. But what does God do? God always starts with a man. He started with Adam and gave him Chava and then began from there. And then there was Noah and then there was Avraham and Sarah, right? And then there was Isaac and Revka. And there was Jacob and Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. And so God always starts with a man. And then from there, he builds a family. And through the family, begins to affect larger things. And so I had to, I had to study this out. So as I did my commentary, I started putting together a book. This is a Torah commentary. And it turned into something quite large authority, headship, and family structure, according to Moses. And in the process, the focus wasn't just on, ooh, how, do you, how does marriage work? I know that my detractors love to say that it's all about that, and I'm going to prove that it's not. But what I began to do was understand God has an authority structure. God, Messiah, man, woman. Paul encapsulates it in 1 Corinthians 11.3. That really is a verse that coalesces all of Scripture into one, one verse where he says, this is the way it works. And so God has a specific structure. If, uh, if there's a rubric, it's a word that uh, is a favorite among my friends. Um, if there's a rubric, that is the rubric for all of Scripture and how God's authority structure works. So we're going to talk about this because it's important for us to understand. But through this book, I walk through each Torah portion and, and also have significant material at the end. But walking through understanding masculinity, understanding femininity, understanding the roles of man and woman and how they're to function together, understanding marriage, understanding where do elders come from? How do we get there? Why does Paul talk about appointing elders? Is he inventing something new? Or is he actually taking a very pragmatic approach that is temporary until something else happens? That's covered in the book. How do the, how do the tribes come together? What's the structure? Why do they function the way that they function? All of this is necessary for the restoration of coal Israel. And it's something that we have to understand and we have to process and we have to begin to come to grips with in order to understand his plan, his purpose, and how his people function in the world. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this very important uh, conversation. I'm going to take pieces from this um, video that was made by David Wilbur and J.K. McKee, and I'm going to address the specific things that they talk about, and I'm going to demonstrate where they make their mistakes, and I'm going to demonstrate what God's Word actually says, and I'm going to demonstrate exactly how these things fit into the restoration 
of Coal Israel because these are pieces parts that are very important. They're significant for our future. And I challenge you to be willing to study and to learn and to grow and to get a big picture. What is it that Yah's doing in the world and, and how is it that he brings us together and what's his plan and purpose in the process? So read both sides of the discussion. I want, you, I, I want you to find out what both sides are saying, but I want you to take the time. I, I want to take the time to introduce you to a lot of material you may not have known that's written because I don't stand here. I don't sit here. I'm sitting here. I don't stand here alone, okay? I don't stand here alone. I stand here with men and women, not just contemporaries today that I know of that understand these things in Scripture that I, I have these conversations with often. But I stand here with Abraham. I stand here with Jacob. I stand here with Moses. I stand here with David. I stand here with Gideon, men approved by God according to Hebrews chapter 11. But some things in their families were a little bit different than what we in Western Christendom think is correct. Why? Where do we get some of these things from? Uh, and I can, I can take you to the places in Greco-Roman paganism where those things come from. And I can demonstrate that God has a very different perspective about marriage than does um, Western Christianity or the traditions that we've inherited. So we've got some future videos coming out. We're going to begin working through these different things, but we're going to talk about mutual submission. Is it really biblical? Is it really that apparent in Scripture? Or is that a is that an idea that's injected for the purpose of, of pushing an agenda that's contrary to all of Scripture and contrary to everything God has to say with regards to authority, headship, and family structure? I, I challenge you. Let's check out both sides. I, I, want to, I want to take time in a video and spend time really looking at some of the sources that, uh, that for me, were the polar opposites of where I come from. And I started studying and reading and understanding what they had to say. Uh, guys like Madan, um, who was the greatest theologian in the 1700s that you've never heard of, be precisely because he was blackballed after he came out um, with a three-volume set, Thelia Thora, uh, explaining exactly what Scripture has to say with regards to marriage and man and woman and righteousness and when he did what you'll find fascinating is is that nearly a third of the hymns that you sing in uh, in church or that you sang in church are to tunes that he wrote and some of the lyrics he wrote but in many cases you won't even find his name in the hymnal because he was so thoroughly erased from history it's a it's a real blessing that today you can go to Amazon and you can order reprints of some of his books from way back in the day. We're going to talk uh, we're, we're going to talk in a video about Mesopotamian paganism. Really? Um, the charges that were laid against our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were laid against Abraham and Jacob and David by uh, Wilbur and McKee are appalling, as they say that these are influenced by Mesopotamian paganism. And we're going to demonstrate from Scripture that God himself had things to say with regards to, to marriage before this time frame and that it clearly is not connected to Mesopotamian paganism. We're also going to talk about this creation ideal. We hear this, this batted around as creation ideal. We're going to spend a video and unpack that. Really, is there such a thing as a creation ideal, or is that a fabrication in order to push an agenda that God never pushes? We're going to talk a little bit about slandering the fathers. Uh, very common in Christendom, very common among detractors of what God's Word says with regards to marriage, very common to slander the fathers and to say things that are appalling when you stop and listen to it and hear it in context. And we're going to listen to some pieces. I may, uh, I, I may bring along some clips from some other teachers and things. We'll just go find some, th some stuff and demonstrate that Christendom has a history. The Hebrew Roots has a history of saying appalling things sinful things that are slanderous and scandalous about our fathers. We will also look at uh, Greek and Hebrew words 
some of the things that in our culture we just assume that words have a particular meaning when in fact scripture either never uses those words or doesn't have the same meaning. And so we want to stop and look at that. I know that there's a point in the video by uh, McKee and Wilbur that they get a big hee-haw over, uh, over something that I said and they just, okay, you know. Um, they didn't do their homework. They did not do their homework. And I will demonstrate that two alleged scholars who want to have a good laugh didn't do their homework. And so this is, this is what's necessary. We need to understand other things that we may address as we go along. We need to under, under, understand what is an orphan. We need to understand what does it mean to take care of widows and orphans? What does it mean to be an alien in Israel? Uh, why, why are these things important? How is it that we can become a people without understanding how we as a family, according to God's word, his Torah, are supposed to function? How are we supposed to be stuck together? How are we supposed to work together? So this is going to be a journey that's going to take multiple videos. I look forward to it. Actually, I, I'm quite thankful that I've been given this platform. I'm quite thankful that we have the opportunity to address, um, address these fallacies and that we have an opportunity to bring truth. I'm thankful that you, the viewer, have an opportunity to hear the other side and then to go do your homework. Do your due diligence, okay? Don't take my word for it, okay? Don't take my word for it. Now, if you do want to see what I have to say about it, there's this. You can also go to my website. I have a blog. I've been writing on my blog since about 2012 or 2013. I forget exactly. There are about 1,600 articles or posts on the blog. Um, they deal with lots of stuff prophecy, deal with uh, scripture, understanding. They deal with, uh, you know, the finer points of the Torah. That deals with all kinds of stuff. And yes, in the last year, I've spent some time, not all of it, some time dealing particularly with family and family structure and fallacies and errors in church and tr Christian tradition that we've inherited, things that we need to shed. On that blog, particularly, there's a page that has nothing but marriage resources and what God has to say with regards to marriage. And so I would encourage you, that is uh, natsav.com, N-A-T-S-A-B.com. And if you go to the uh, Biblical Marriage page, there are resources. That's where you can find links to many of the books I just named, as well as others and articles that will deal with really one of the core issues that sets people's hair on fire. But I challenge you, read both sides. Get all the information. You be the judge because at the end of the day, you will stand before Elohim and give account for what you believe. And a good defense won't be because JK or Wilbur told me so. That's not going to work. It won't fly. Okay. So you need to do your own due diligence and uh, look forward to hearing your stories because I know what happens. You're going to start doing the research and you're going to go, oh my goodness, I had no idea. And it's shocking. It really is. It's downright shocking because ultimately one of the one of the things that drove James Campbell to write his history of marriage in 1869, one of the things that drove Martin Madan to write Thelia Thora, a three volume tome, uh, one of the things that drove Ochino, Bernardino Ochino, uh, Bernardino Ochino to uh, do the research and come up with the writings that he did in the 1500s is because he saw the plight of women and he saw the fact that um, the world around us does not value women. And we see that in feminism. It's something that maybe we'll address at some point. Feminism does not value women. God's ways value women. However, God's ways are not what's actively taught in the church. It's not, a, not what's actively taught in the Hebrew roots or Messianic community. It's not even what's actively taught in parts of Judaism. And we'll identify that. We'll demonstrate it. I can prove it. Okay? So I look forward to spending time with you with multiple videos. We're going to have guests. We're going to have people that, that, uh, that uh, the interview. This is going to get some stuff started. Uh, frankly, I want to thank um, David Wilbur. And I want to thank J.K. McKee because for some time I have needed to take the next step. I appreciate you giving me a platform. I appreciate you giving me a gold mine of material to begin working with and to begin working from. But from here, we'll be able to identify what truth is. And I challenge you two gentlemen. 
I challenge you to read the other side. Just as you, just as you claim that I have it, I will show you uh, books. I'll show you markups. I'll prove that not only did I read the other side, your side, but I have quotes from your side within your within your side that says that they know that you that uh, that your position is indefensible with the scriptures alone. And so I look forward to this. And uh, this is going to be interesting. I pray that the Father walk with us and that the Father guide us on this journey that will take multiple videos. Shalom. Why did God create Adam? Adam. Why did God create Chava? What was his purpose? Why did he create them the way that he did in the order that he did? How does that play into the structure of Israel? How do we, how do we understand how families operate? How do we understand how clans and tribes operate? If you're passionate about the restoration of Kol Israel, how is it that all of that is supposed to happen? Well, the Torah has a lot of great answers and all of it is completely supported in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. And the message is consistent from beginning to end. God has a consistent message about authority, headship, and family structure. So this is a commentary that uh, is used for the Torah and it's broken down by, um, by uh, individual Torah portions. So there are over a hundred pages of additional material in the back, uh, in the appendices, that helps support and understand a lot of challenging topics that are relevant today and have, have meaning and relevance today in our lives. I strongly recommend that you go to Amazon and you can get this book from Amazon either in Kindle version or as a hard copy. Uh, also, I have been reading this into my podcast, and so you can get it for free simply listening to the podcast, and that's perfectly all right. I prefer that you just get the information. It's a, at $15, I'm not making anything on this, making almost nothing. But the point is, is it's important for us, Cole Israel, to be looking at and understanding and beginning to walk out what his plan is for his people and how we're to function together.